Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, enlightened investors. So happy to be back with you again today. And we're going to take a look here at how a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and a high fashion runway model are breaking barriers in the commercial real estate space so you can do the same. Andrea Quick and Rachel Grun are full-time real estate investors, syndicators, and leaders in the industry with ownership in over 1,400 apartment units. And together, they are co-founders and managing partners of Good Good Investing. They have established and they are empowered entrepreneurs with financial freedom through passive real estate family investing here. So, Rachel and Andrea, Andrea, please take us into the show and share a memorable experience from your formative years that may have helped you to be who you are today. Yeah, so I was raised homeschooled. So for me, I was raised in a real estate family. And I would say a formative experience was um, instead of sitting in like a math or geometry class, I was out with my mom and my dad at their flip project, scraping up tile, laying backsplash, like really learning actionable life you know, different types of real estate investing things that you just cannot learn in, you know, middle school, public schools or anything like that. So that was super formative for me and set me on the trajectory that I'm on today, for sure. Wow. Great experience. How about you, Andrea? So I was born to a mom who is from Ecuador and I really didn't grow up learning about money or investing, but I knew that my mom worked really hard for what she had. I remember not having a car until I was like nine years old or something. So later on in life, I made it a priority to really learn about money management and investing. And um, that's been a pivot for me. And it's been great education and now very passionate to teach others about it. Well, wonderful. Thank you for sharing with us a bit about your lives here. Well, you say that investors should not get blinded by projected returns and that we should always be looking out for red flags to consider before deciding what we are going to invest in. So what do you mean by that? Well, You know, during COVID, we were seeing really extreme rent bumps. I mean, in some markets, it was as high as 22% per year. And I think moving forward, I don't think it's realistic to consider that that kind of rent spike is going to continue. So what I mean by that is red flags to look for for before you invest is make sure that underwriting is, is conservative, even though we've seen an unprecedented past couple of years. Frankly, no one's too certain what the next couple of years are going to bring. And so I think it's really important that people don't get blinded by projected returns, but just make sure that the the people that they're considering investing with have done their due diligence and are being conservative with their projections. Yeah, it's always a good idea to go on the conservative side. It's always nice to have a nice surprise if reality exceeds projections. It's always very, very disappointing the other way around. So yes, under promise very, over deliver. Yes, absolutely. Good advice there. Well, due diligence for passive investors. What does that entail? And well, first of all, distinguish for us the difference between a passive investor and an active investor. Yeah, so an active investor is also known as a general partner. The general partner is a team of individuals who are looking for deals to acquire, and they're analyzing the deals with different goals in mind. One is they're looking for a place where there where there's economic growth. They're also looking at a place where people are moving to, and they're looking for a landlord-friendly area. So we analyze 100 deals uh, to find one. That's the general partnership team. They also take the business they, they create a business strategy and they also oversee the property management and also the execution of the business strategy. 
So that's the general partnership team. And then the passive investors are really there as capital partners with the, the general partnership team. And they deploy their capital and they get informed on a monthly basis through reports from the general partnership team. And then they are passively investing. That means that they just collect the returns off of the performance of the asset. And so thank you for that, Andrea, uh, explanation of that. So in terms of the passive investor in their particular due diligence process, you just outlined what it is that an active investor goes through in doing their due diligence and coming to a deal and presenting a deal. Obviously, that is not something for a passive investor. So even though we call it passive, there are certainly things that passive investors need to do to ensure that they're getting into a deal that is going to be financially successful for them. So what are your suggestions for them in terms of their due diligence? That's actually a great question. And we were actually discussing that this morning, yeah. even like different questions to ask a deal sponsor or a general partnership team before you invest. I think it's important to know if they've been in that submarket before, if they've worked in that submarket, if they have properties there, if they have a property management team that they trust there. Also, we were talking about this morning asking if they are creating a new LLC for that acquisition, because otherwise they could be inheriting problems from an existing LLC that they're buying into. So I think creating a new entity for each property is important as well. If you want to ask if how much, you know, they and their families are investing the property, you know, just make sure that they're putting their money where their mouth is and they have skin in the game as well is very important. And then, yeah, finding out that their business strategy aligns with your goals. If you maybe are looking towards retirement, maybe cash flow is a really big indicator for you. If you have a W-2 or a 1099 that you love, maybe it's the appreciation that's more important and not so much the cash flow. So just asking them those kinds of questions. And then also asking how they're adjusting their underwriting for inflation. Property management expenses are rising and so are interest rates. And you want to make sure that they're stress testing for the uncertainties that the what I think the next 24 months are going to bring. Yeah, and I'll just add, know your team. So know the experience of the team, um, like Rachel said, where they've invested before. And then also ask for some deal samples and see what kind of returns they've done in the past. Ask for the good and the medium and the ugly and see what you get. Yeah. Good advice there, because even the most excellent operators are going to have disappointing returns from time to time. So, yeah, that's a good idea. To, and to if they at. say that they don't, they either have not been doing it long enough or, <laughs> or they're lying and both are bad. <laughs> yes, and both are, are terribly bad. I think probably the mo the worst one is is the inexperienced team. Yes. Uh, who has a wonderful story. <laughs> but, yes, correct. But no experience. Well, uh, you say that time, the great equalizer, and I've heard that so many, many different times in many different ways that really the only scarcity is time and all of us have restrictions on our time. And so it's important to use that wisely and to the best of our abilities to make the best lives that all of us can with the time that we have here. So how do we make the most of our, our 24 hours and what are some of the things that you are doing to ensure that you are using what little time you have on this earth to the best advantage? So what we mean by time is the great equalizer is it doesn't matter where you come from or where you are. Um, everyone has 24 hours in a day. And like you said, it's the one thing you can't buy or sell. So it's really important that we do use our time to the best of our ability. And we're so passionate about that with passive investing because it is exactly that. It's a time, it's a time freedom. It's a way to invest without spending any extra time that frankly we don't have and our investors certainly don't have. So um Andrea and I, we have families, you know, we have passions and hobbies. And our passion is to find ways to deploy our capital in a way that that doesn't eat up any more of our precious 24 hours. And that's why we're so passionate about education as well, to let people know that there is a better way to invest. And then it gives us time to do other things with, with our with our day. Like I know Andrea is really passionate about, you know, reinvesting in her community and then also spending time with fam 
family because you can't get that back. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just say we want our investors to work because they want to work, not because they have to. And that's the biggest thing is having this freedom where you can do what you want to do, but you need to make income while you sleep, right? There's a really big difference between being rich and being wealthy, and we want to create wealth. And the wealth is making us money while we sleep and doing what we really want to do with the time that we have. I've heard it said that a job will pay your bills, a business will make you rich, but your investments will make you wealthy. So we really Mm -hmm. take that to heart too. I think it was Warren Buffett that said that unless you're making money while you'll sleep, you will work until the day you die. So indeed, that that's a wonderful illustration there of the difference that you just made there between working, between getting rich and wealth. And they are very, very different things there. Well, you have done some impressive things here in the real estate world, which there's no secret that uh, real estate is a male-dominated industry, but you have done it as women. So what are some of the barriers you've had to deal with and to overcome, and, and how have you managed to do that? Well, I think we've tried to take a spin on a different way to have even like a podcast and educating, you know, a lot of financial shows are pretty serious and we're trying to put a fun spin to it. So as women, we're coming up with a different model for educating. And then the other thing is we really look for ways to, I mean, we look for other ways to encourage women to do the same because I feel like in this industry that is dominated by men, sometimes, even if people don't know it, we do start off at a deficit when we're talking to brokers. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) it's just something. Yeah. I just think that they feel the need to over explain or, you know, I just feel like sometimes we're under, what is the word underestimated. Right. And um, we love to change the narrative there and surprise people. I think we've surprised a lot of people in our time together as two women dominating the commercial real estate industry. And it's exciting, honestly, like I'm not discouraged by it. I love surprising people and being underestimated because it just means that (laughs) (laughs) I can show them like what we're really made of. And we're just hope that we're just blazing a trail that other women can get encouraged by, you know, because we are mothers. It's not real estate or being a mom. It's not mutually exclusive. We can do both well. And luckily investing in something that, that is passive gives us the opportunities to still be present with our family. But I think a lot of women think, you know what, I'm a stay at home mom. I can't get into real estate because I don't want to take time away from my family, but it is possible to do both. Yeah. I was going to say we are turning it around because now, you know, even though we talk to women and men, I know that we're, we're, putting it at the forefront of our friends' minds too that are women. You know, mostly finances typically have been led by the husband or the man in the family. And we're talking to women and we're educating them that it is something to bring up to their husbands and to have as a priority. Mm-hmm. Well, I have a question here. When you you say that you start off with a deficit, do you find that to be true whether you are dealing with another woman or is it primarily when you are dealing with men? I would say dealing with men. Not to say that we were treated rudely, but it's more like they wanted to, so like versus when my husband would call the brokers, I noticed that they would ask for more information from me, like, oh, how long have you really been doing this? What's your team like? Whereas with him, they'd just be like, yeah, for sure. We'll send you some stuff in that market. So that's, I saw that a lot with the, and it is a boys club and I've seen it a lot with, with the male brokers. There's very few female brokers. So, but in my experience with them, it's been a lot better. We were able to connect and, you know, even talk about our family some, which has been wonderful, but I would say, would you say majority men? Yeah, majority yeah. men. So how and why did you actually decide to leave your previous industries? Andrea, you were in the tech industry and Rachel, you were in the high fashion industry. Why did you decide to make that leap and how have you made that leap? 
Yeah. So I remember distinctly, there was a day where I called my husband and he was working at high tech and I was too, but I was already home with the kids, but I called him and I said, you know, what time are you coming home? And again, he answered with, I'm going to have to stay at work and please come and bring the kids and let's eat at, let's eat dinner at the cafeteria so I can still see you, but I'm going to have to go back to work after that. And it was at that point where I was like, is this the life we're supposed to live where we grind so much and most of our time that we can't get back is spent at work. And I decided at that point that there had to be a better way. And so I really looked at people just that I looked up to that were wealthy and was seeing what they were doing. And they were all invested in commercial real estate and specifically multifamily. And so it just opened up our mind to really concentrate on getting out of working and grinding and even the stock market and pivoting to real estate. Yeah, that's good. So my story is interesting. So I started working at 15 years old as a um, model here in Dallas, Texas. And then when I was 17, I was deciding whether to continue going to college or move to Europe. And I got a contract to go to Paris, France for a year. And I went and I modeled there and it was amazing. And my career just took off. And so I actually ended up pursuing that for 11 years. I was trying to do the math. 11 years. And I was doing high fashion runway across the world. So I lived in London. I lived in Paris, Milan, New York, all across the US and you know Europe. And I was walking for like Dior and Valentino and Marc Jacobs and Gucci. And I was just doing all of it. Right. And I, you know, most people don't have disposable income at 18, 19, 20 years old. And I did, fortunately. And because I grew up in a real estate family, my parents were very, you know, outspoken about like, you have to start investing that money. You don't know when, you know, they're going to stop calling. So I did. I started investing in real estate. And seven years ago, my mom found multifamily investing. And she told me, she was like, Rachel, you have to sell your single family portfolio and put it all into multifamily. And I just trusted her. And this was in 2015. And that's exactly what I did. I was still modeling and acting and doing all that. And I was living in Los Angeles in 2020. And of course, COVID happened. My industry completely dried up overnight to where, I mean, my husband and I were living on savings because there was no modeling and no acting. You can't work from home doing either one of those things. And, you know, I'm in my late twenties now. And I was like, well, I'm going to have to start thinking about a plan B anyway, because there is an expiration date for modeling. So that's when I said, you know what? I want to start a family. This is kind of the perfect excuse to press the reset button. I'm going to move back to Dallas. And so my husband and I moved back to Dallas in 2020 and I dove into real estate full-time. I am syndication. And then also I'm a realtor in Dallas as well. And we started a family and I still model a little bit here and there whenever they call. But yeah, that was like the kick I needed to just start doing it full time. So I went from fully passively investing, which I loved, to now 50% passive and 50% active. Well, interesting how uh, how life plays out and, uh, and different things tell us that it's time to take a, a different route than what we have. Well, Andrea, you shared with us uh, the triggering uh, event, essentially. But how did you how did you actually make that leap from entrepreneur in uh, Silicon Valley to a real estate investor? Well, it took a leap of faith. We sold some 401k and stock and just studied all about commercial real estate, joined a networking group and learned about multifamily, and then took a leap of faith into putting, moving our money from stock into our first multifamily investment. So it was a very, you know, passive way to go about it. Well, once we did it, and then we saw the returns, that mailbox money on the quarterly payout, we were hooked. We're like, okay, we see that the future where we could live off of this passive income. So then we decided to take more money out of our stock market in 401k and put it into the next deal. And well, now, you know, 1200 units later, we're getting quarterly payouts on a consistent basis, and we're hooked. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I mean, so many different ways really to get into real estate investing. And and obviously, you all took uh, the passive way to do that, which leads to the next question here, because I think passive investing is a good way to get educated, particularly in commercial real estate investing. As practical and as a really a smart way to get into that, there are so many people who have no idea that that you can even do that. People think of real estate investing as purchasing uh, the rundown house down the road and and renting that out. And that's that's the way to get into real estate. Obviously, you didn't do that. So talk to us about what it is that you all have to offer in terms of education and the various different ways and means that our viewers and listeners can get in touch with you to take advantage of that. Yeah, so our our huge tenant of our business is education through our podcast, Good Good Investing, and then also on our website, goodgoodinvesting.com. We have tons of educational resources for potential investors, seasoned and aspiring. And we do that because I think education is also the great equalizer because there are so many opportunities that become available to you once you start educating yourself. And I'm not talking about a college degree. I'm not talking about spending tens of thousands of dollars. I'm talking about, you know, just taking advantage of the resources available to you. So because someone educated us along the way, we want to pay it forward essentially and let people know that there is a better way to spend their time and money and they don't have to beat the pavement and single family investing in order to take advantage of real estate. So we do also offer investment opportunities for investors, accredited and non-accredited across the board. And in order to see the opportunities that we have available and it's multifamily, it's all institutional size, hundred unit plus multifamily buildings that we invest in. In order to see those, you just have to go to our website and sign up for an investor discovery call because we cannot present opportunities to people unless we've had at least one qualifying conversation. So if people are interested, they feel educated or they want to get more educated, they are so welcome to get in touch with us, touch with us that way. Wonderful. And all of that information will be in the show notes. And uh, there are multiple ways to connect with uh, Andrea and Rachel. Well, one last question for you women before we leave today, and uh, that is share with us one of your most difficult setbacks in life. It could be with real estate or anything else. And how did you come through that time? And what were the major lessons you learned from that? I think for me, one of the most difficult setbacks was just overcoming my self-critical thoughts. Just even before starting the podcast with Rachel, it was a huge leap of faith because I'm more of a shyer person. So to put myself out there and be vulnerable and educate and teach people was already so big for me. But I will say that when you push yourself and you overcome something that's really hard or maybe it's a really big weakness inside of you, you will be so much more confident and there's so much growth in that. And that will propel you and possibly even change the trajectory of your life. Yeah, that's good. I love that. So my biggest hurdle was I actually got divorced at a very young age at 23. And I had saved up a lot of money from modeling and I had a lot of money invested and I lost all of my liquid cash in that divorce. I still had my investments, but of course they were tied up in holds. And so during that divorce, I actually went $25,000 into debt and it was super difficult. I didn't have enough money in my bank account to pay for my credit card minimums. So that was a really, really hard time. And I'm so happy to say that all I have now is a car payment, <laughs> no other debt. And it's you know, I'm in the black now, which is awesome. But yeah, that was really difficult. And I think the biggest lesson that I learned is always have an emergency fund. You never know what's what could happen, whether it's medical or it's life or it's accident related. So I tell my investors, like there's such thing as smart investing. Don't give us your last dollar. And even though maybe my net worth on paper was high at the moment, I was very desperate because it was not liquid in my bank account. And so I had wished that maybe I didn't put everything into investments. It's paid off since, but it was a very scary, like 18 months, definitely. Yeah. Well, I said this was my last question, but we have time for just one more. And that is partnerships are so important in real estate. So how did the two of you uh, become partners? 
take that. It's a good story. So yeah, we were at a conference called the Fire Summit. And I remember Rachel's mom went to my husband because he is well dressed and asked about who dressed him, right? He is very well dressed. <laughs> he he is he knows how to do fashion, but he gave me some credit. And so she introduced Rachel and I together and we were local, we're women in, you know, a room filled with men. And so we decided to just meet up for coffee. And from there, we decided to start a podcast. And we've just been the best partners. I am like a big visionary and strategy person. And Rachel um, also has amazing ideas, but she's very much an execution person and is all about the details. So our partnership is just perfect because we even each other out and she brings skills that I don't have. And maybe I bring skills that she doesn't have. So. Yes. Ex- oh, totally. 100%. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Rachel? I mean, it's so important to find someone that creates a space where you feel like you can share your own ideas and opinions without judgment. You know, we're very open with each other. There's been some ideas that she's had where I'm like, Andrea, no. And there's been some ideas where I've had where she's like, Rachel, no. And just the freedom to feel like, you know, we can express that to each other and we both can create, you know, make each other think bigger, but then also rein each other in. It's like perfect. Yeah. And there has to be a lot of trust there as well. So trust is key for sure. Yep. Well, Enlightened Investors, what an inspiring, inspirational show we have had today. Thanks so much for being with us and join us next time in our next episode. Rachel and Andrea, thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance, brought to you by Steve Talker Capital, a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steve Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steve Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at stevetalker.com.